Good morning. My name is Eileen Sorrentino, and I am a part of the worship team here. I welcome you to First Church, First Unitarian Church in New Bedford. We are a diverse community of spiritual seekers who come together to serve each other and our community with love and compassion. As members of the Unitarian Universalist Association, we believe in the freedom of religious expression in a supportive environment, in the never-ending search for truth, and in the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We are a people of purpose, and everyone is welcome in this sanctuary. If you are new here and would like more information about our congregation, please fill out the blue card that you'll find in your pew and put it in the offertory box when it comes around, or give it to me or one of the ushers. This will put you on our mailing list to receive our newsletter to keep you informed of all the activities going on in the church. Pl mm. Child care is available in the green room for smaller children if you need it, but um, Yasmin is doing a religious education service today. No? Yes. yes. She's doing way cool Sunday school this morning. <laughs> um, and now, if you'll please put your electronic devices in worship mode, we will begin by lighting our chalice. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. The opening words. This is from uh, New Bedford's Church by Fred Giffen. Upon the death of Judge Oliver Prescott in 1908, the Prescott family offered to fill the space created with the removal of the stained glass window from the frame behind the pulpit during recent innovations. The Prescott children, Helen P. Stetson, Oliver Prescott Jr., and Mary R. Prescott, submitted their written proposal to a special meeting of the congregation on October 19th, 1909. A quote from, that, from the records. We would like to place in the vacant window space in the rear of the pulpit a glass mosaic as a memorial to our father and mother. The meeting acknowledged and accepted the gift with the naming of a committee to work with the Prescott siblings. The current Tiffany mosaic, the largest of its kind in the country, was put into place over the next two years and dedicated in September 1911. And now if You'll, um, the opening hymn is number 298, Wake Now My Senses. Oh, 
Now is the time to greet one another. And um, if you will remain standing or stand if you're still sitting, <laughs> and we'll recite the um, covenant together. We come together as a religious community, upholding freedom of conscience, right relationship, and the inherent worth of all people. We value our diversity and pledge to care for one another in the spirit of compassion to speak and listen to each other with respect, and to promote justice and kindness in the world. And Yasmin will read us her story for all ages. Good morning, everybody. So I was in Louisville, Kentucky for um, a conference with my students in something called Skills USA, We were competing for the Early Childhood National Competition. Came in ninth and fifth. I'm hoping to make gold eventually. But I went to um, the greatest museum ever, Muhammad Ali. And I was so inspired, it was moving. I basically cried. It was sort of like the Guggenheim, where it's done and you travel each floor and as you get to the bottom, you feel like you had the whole history and story. And I thought, wow, what a great thing to do for a man of Kentucky who was so influential. And it inspired me that he was not allowed to box for five years because he refused to go into the military. And here he is, you know, they call him the greatest. So I thought, wow, what's, who's the military hero in our hometown? So I'm going to talk about that today. If you don't already know about Sergeant William Carney, he actually was the first African-American soldier here in New Bedford to enlist in the 40, 54th Regiment. Signed up right here. As a matter of fact, his house is around the corner. And Brody and I, we have some, we, first thing he said today, he goes, you know, I think Frederick Douglass probably was in this church at one time. And I said, you know what? I'm thinking William Carney was too. I'm not necessarily sure where because we know there were certain um, black and white rules in place, but this is about Carney today. And his house is around the corner. We have a custom house square dedicated to them. So... Here are some of the pictures of the people of that regiment. On February 29th in 1840, William Carney was actually a slave born in Norfolk, Virginia. My New York accent just came out. The son of slaves, um, they end up coming to New Bedford on what? Yes, the Underground Railroad. And so his father eventually got their mother to join them. And then in 1861, yes, the American Civil War broke out. And black men were excluded from the military service until 1863 when Abraham Lincoln did what? Does anyone know? Brody. 
He signed. Yes, the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes. Yeah, the people down south, they didn't even, like, it was like several years later. You're right. So shortly after that, he joins the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment, the first official all-black unit in United States history, generating right here in the city of New Bedford. A recruiting, a recruiting station enlisted the men. There are at least 25% of those men were residents of New Bedford. So not only was he this wonderful soldier, he actually received the Medal of Honor because at an attack at Fort Wagner in South Carolina, it was an honor to be the person to hold the flag when your troops were marching on. And so he did that. And so with that being said, the unit suffered some really bad casualties. And unfortunately, Carney was hurt. He was just injured. And he was treated, but he said, I will not let this flag touch the ground. Boys, I did my duty. It is my honor to pass this on to the next person to bring in our troops. And so in 1900, he was the first African American to receive that award. You should also know that he became the first black postman of the city of New Bedford, right down here. If you haven't been in the post office, just take a tour. It's quite a lovely building. Not only did he do that, but he eventually came to be um, working in the state house. And it was there that there was a terrible accident that he ended up dying in the elevator at the state house. That led our state house and the state of Massachusetts, the first time ever, they put the flag at half staff for William Carney. So here we are, oftentimes we see our flag lowered down to honor and respect those. And William Carney, Sergeant William Carney, right here in our city, um, was certainly influential at a time when a lot of people didn't really um, want to pledge their allegiance to something that they didn't, didn't feel welcomed or um, equal. So what we're doing at the Way Cool Sunday School today is because Veterans Day is coming up, and I know we have Thursday off, we will be writing letters to donate, um, not donate, but to just send our love to the veteran uh, VFW right down the street. So. We are honoring William Carney. We will get to his house around the corner when we have a little bit more um, time after our solstice service. So we will carry on to Way Cool Sunday School. And in honor of Sergeant William Carney Academy, thank you for holding our flag and being such a brave hero to our city.
Thank you, Randy. In light of our subject matter this morning, it seemed appropriate for him to play a piece by Philip Glass. So <laughs> I hope you appreciate that. Um, we're taking the sermon out of order this, uh, this morning because our speaker is the director of the New Bedford Glass Museum, which he has to open at noon. So um, in order for him not to be pressed for time, we just move the sermon up. So um, you want to come up? So this gentleman is Kirk Nelson, and he will speak to us. Uh, uh, his talk is called Talking Tiffany. Good morning, everyone. Um, although I do consider myself to be a, a glass evangelist, uh, this will be my first officially recognized and um, ecumenically approved sermon. Um, another uh, title for the, for the talk might be Thy Kingdom Come, Re Revisiting New Bedford's Giant Tiffany Mosaic. In 1911, your spectacular Tiffany mosaic was installed here in the chancel of the First Unitarian Church of New Bedford. It was said to cover 300 square feet, according to a Tiffany Studios brochure published that same year. And it presents a robed figure wandering through a craggy wooded landscape watched over by an angel hovering to the upper left. Authors have celebrated the mosaic as one of Tiffany's outstanding accomplishments. They have attributed its contribution to Tiffany designer Frederick Wilson and assigned it more than half a dozen different titles, including The Seeker, The Seeker and Guardian Angel, The Wanderer, The Pilgrim, The Pilgrimage of Life, Thy Kingdom Come, and The Progress of Man. Inspiration for the subject is credited to, credited to Eliza Scudder's 1852 Unitarian hymn, Thou Grace Divine Encircling All, the second verse of which reads, quote, When over the dizzy heights we go, one soft hand blinds our eyes, the other leads us safe and slow, O love of God most wise. Now, surprisingly, None of this most basic information about the mosaic, except its date and size, has been documented with primary sources. In other words, we haven't been able to tell what the basis or evidence has been for much of the published information about the mosaic. And even something as easily verifiable as Tiffany Studios' own published claim in 1911 regarding the size of the mosaic turns out to be colossally wrong. The most frustrating deficiency in published scholarship has been the lack of consensus regarding the title of the composition. By what name do we call it? How do we search for it in the various databases about Tiffany Glass? The most recent book to reference the mosaic is Tiffany's Glass Mosaic, written, uh, Mosaics, written by Kelly Conway and Lindsay Parrott, published by the Corning Museum of Glass in 2017. In that book, the mosaic is called The Wanderer. The Wanderer also appeared as the title used on First Unitarian Church, uh, Church's website, while a pamphlet published by the church in the 1980s alternately gives the title as Thy Kingdom Come. Dan Harper, in his book, Liberal Pilgrims, Varieties of Liberal Religious Experience in New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, which was published in 2011, makes a uh, passing reference to the mosaic, noting that, quote, the church has titled the mosaic, The Pilgrimage of Life. Stained glass scholar, Dr. Virginia Chifo Reagan presented a lecture in New Bedford in 2005 where she referred to the mosaic as, quote, the seeker and guardian angel. While 
author Edith Crouch, uh, who wrote The Mosaics of Lewis Comfort Tiffany, published in 2009, refers to the mosaic in her photo captions as the seeker, and then adds in parentheses, also known as the pilgrim, the kingdom come, and the progress of man. Now, Crouch introduce us, introduces us to an important um, primary source when she shares an image of the mosaic that was published by Tiffany Studios in 1913 in a promotional catalog titled Memorials in Glass and Stone. Um, referring to the illustration, Crouch writes, shown is a photograph of, quote, the seeker, end quote. And her use of quotation marks around the seeker suggest that the title as well as the image came from the Tiffany Studios booklet. But examination of an original copy at the Corning Museum of Glass proved disappointing. The illustration of the mosaic is captioned only, quote, a Tiffany Favreal glass mosaic panel. Now, the New Bedford Museum of Glass undertook a study of the mosaic in the spring of 2019, the same year that we re relocated the, our museum to the James Arnold Mansion, uh, located diagonally across uh, Union and County Streets from First Unitarian. The Arnold Mansion, by the way, had served as the residence uh, during the 1870s and 80s of William J. Roach, the president of New Bedford's famous Mount Washington Glass Company. And in 1911, the Roach family presented the Bell Tower Bell uh, to First Unitarian in William's memory. Our goal in undertaking uh, the study of the mosaic was to review all the known primary source documents, add to them if possible, and hopefully resolve some of the questions about the mosaic's origin and history. One primary source, the uh, 1913 uh, Tiffany booklet um, cited by Edith Crouch entitled Memorials in Glass and Stone, has been mentioned. Uh, Crouch, Crouch also references a 1911 Tiffany Studios brochure supposedly featuring a color illustration of the mosaic on its cover with text that reads, quote, it is the largest and most intricate work of its kind in America, covering over 300 square feet of wall space, requiring over a year to complete, and containing many thousands of separate pieces of glass, end quote. No further information about the brochure, including its current location, is provided by Crouch in her book. And finally, Crouch introduces readers to a third important primary source, the Xerox copy of an undated newspaper clipping from the church files here that illustrates the mosaic with a, a fuzzy photograph and reads, quote, a particularly noticeable work of art in glass is the large mosaic panel designed by the Tiffany Studios of New York and executed in Tiffany Favreal glass under the personal direction and supervision of Louis C. Tiffany, which has been placed in the chancel wall of the Unitarian Church in the city, directly behind the pulpit. Upon entering the church, one at first sees a vision which appears to come from the soft gray walls, and distinctly the theme of the subject which is portrayed by a beautiful landscape effect embracing a deep ravine lined on either side with massive trees, luxuriant foliage, and bold rocks. The peace and tranquility of the valley is disturbed by the swish and murmur of a little stream, which is seen winding its way through the fertile valley. The principal figure of the design is a pilgrim whose journey has suddenly been interrupted as he climbs upward by a large tree which seems to stand defiantly in his course, compelling him to pass it by, climbing around a dangerous narrow ledge. This the pilgrim is accomplishing in safety, for nearby is his guardian angel, whose presence leads him on in perfect confidence. Expanding the no uh, this knowledge base proved surprisingly easy thanks to generous help from Minister Karen LeBlanc, church staff, and Judith Lund. Sometime in the 1980s, the church transferred a number of records 
from its archives to the library of the old Dartmouth Historical Society for safekeeping. Included among the records is a previously unpublished Tiffany Studios brochure devoted exclusively to the New Bedford mosaic. It presents the same text that Crouch quotes from um, the 1911 brochure, uh, the one that supposedly has a cover, color illustration on the cover, but um, which we, we uh, don't know the whereabouts of. But it has an additional line, this is the brochure at the Old Dartmouth Historical Society, that reads, quote, the subject is thy kingdom come, depicted by a pilgrim assembling dangerous mountain pass, guided on his way by a guardian angel. And on the basis of this wonderful documentation, we can now state definitively that the original title for the First Unitarian Church Mosaic is Thy Kingdom Come. Also among the church records preserved at the Old Dartmouth Historical Society are six letters from, the 19, uh, from 1909 relating to the proposed gift um, of the mosaic as a memorial to Judge Oliver and Helen H. Prescott from their children. And we heard a little, a, a little um, quote from that, uh, from those records. Um, so I won't, uh, I won't uh, repeat that here. Um, but what was interesting is um, they say that of, uh, um, that quote, um, so let's see, so the adopted vote um, that quote, the same committee which had in its charge the recent renovation of the interior of the church be authorized to confer with the donors on behalf of the society in the matter of the design of the proposed memorial and accept on behalf of the society any design which in their judgment would satisfy the society. Um, so before the, the Tiffany window, uh, Tiffany mosaic went in, there was a window um, on the wall behind us and in the archive, there are some photographs of the church interior taken in, 19, in 1875 that show that, um, that window. It's very uh, interesting to see them. And uh, I have images over at the Glass Museum if anybody would like to, uh, like to look at them. Now, finally, the records at the Historical Society include two important newspaper clippings. And the fact that they were over at the Society meant that many um, one could possibly say all of the researchers that wrote, that have written books about this and possibly come to the church looking for records weren't aware of them. And it was only uh, because Judy Lund told me that they were over there uh, that uh, I was able to go find them. Um, so included in the records are two newspaper clippings. Um, one is the original clipping for the undated um, Xerox uh, here at the church. Um, but this one includes the upper portion, which uh, tells us that it's from New Bedford's Evening Standard and was published uh, September 16th, 1911. So now we know the source of that clipping and the, uh, and the exact date. The other newspaper clipping is a much larger article, um, came out uh, from the Evening Standard on Monday, October 2nd, 2011 which includes portions of what undoubtedly was a dedication sermon delivered the day before by Reverend W. B. Gagan. This article establishes a rich cultural context for the uh, mosaic. Of particular importance uh, is the statement that, quote, the panel was designed by Frederick Wilson of New York and was installed by artists of the Tiffany Studios of New York, um, who worked on the mosaic at the church for about a month. So now we have confirmation uh, from a contemporary source that the designer of Thy Kingdom Come was indeed Frederick Wilson. The article also states that, quote, approximately half a million pieces of colored glass have been used in the composition of the picture. And it gives the dimensions of the mosaic as 20 feet high by 10 feet wide. Now, if you do the math here, you'll realize that the overall size of the mosaic should, according to the newspaper, be 200 square feet, substantially less than the 300 square feet claimed by the 1911 Tiffany Studios brochure. 
Uh, naturally, we were eager to determine which size is correct by actually measuring the mosaic, and from that we learned that the 200 square feet figure cited by the newspaper article is the accurate one. Sadly, it would appear that Tiffany was given to a bit of, shall we say, self-aggrandizement. Author Martin Edelberg's 2007 book, A New Light on Tiffany, Clara Driscoll and the Tiffany Girls, shares the startling revelation that many of Tiffany's lampshade designs, long attributed to Tiffany himself, actually were designed by Clara Driscoll and other women working in the lampshade department. The revelation followed the discovery of Driscoll's extensive diaries, and the lamps in question include many of Tiffany's most famous designs, such as the dragonfly and wisteria lamps. Tiffany was not particularly interested in sharing credit. Uh, publicity attention was focused almost exclusively on Tiffany himself and on the Tiffany firm, a tendency that is reinforced by the 1914 book, The Art Work of Louis C. Tiffany, which was privately published by Tiffany in an edition of 500, not for sale, intended exclusively for family, friends, and associates. Tiffany hired the respected art connoisseur Charles Decay, who was an art and literary critic for the New York Times, to write the book, yet nowhere in the book, on the title page, for example, where we would expect to find it, does Charles Decay's name appear. It was all about Tiffany. Issues of uh, aggrandizement aside, uh, First Unitarians Mosaic, Thy Kingdom Come, is a spectacular treasure and an artistic landmark of international importance. And we gladly uh, forgive the church if you wish to indulge in a little bit of pride yourselves. Um, and one final word, uh, some of you may have noticed uh, this deficiency in um, my effort to document all of the published statements about the mosaic uh, I have yet to count the individual pieces of glass in the mosaic to see if the total uh, comes to, quote, approximately half a million. So if there is a volunteer here who would be willing to undertake this task and, and who can supply their own ladder, um, please raise your hand and I'll be happy to uh, speak with you after the uh, service. No? I don't see anybody out there. All righty, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Please come forward and ask the questions. I'm tethered. Oh, you're tethered. This is tethered. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been wondering if I'm assuming that. Um, there is a patina of age and other things that have made it less vibrant than it was when it mm. was installed. And can you give us an impression of how it might have really been and whether there's any hope to ever restore it? Um, thank you, yes. Um, patina was a nice word to use uh, for the surface of the mosaic. In the records, there are some letters back and forth between the church and uh, a conservation, a restoration company. Um, they were having trouble back in the, the middle of the 20th century with the little pieces, the, the tesserae of the mosaic coming off, coming out. And unfortunately, the, the restoration company's solution to this was to paint a coat of shellac over the window, or over the mosaic. And so that has yellowed considerably, and um, I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that uh, modern restoration techniques could restore this to its original, original look. Uh, the mosaic is described as Favrile glass, and Favrile was Tiffany's fancy name for his, um, his blown glass line which typically included an iridescent surface. And as you can see, there's no iridescence on this glass. Um, and so it would be 
a, a, a really exciting and worthwhile project to bring this back because it is truly one of the, one of the great Tiffany mosaics. The size has been exaggerated a little bit, um, but 200 square feet is astounding. Uh, for reference, there are a couple of other Tiffany mosaics that are larger. The Curtis Publishing Building in Philadelphia has an enormous Tiffany mosaic that was um, designed by Maxfield Parish, right about the same time as, as this mosaic, and it measures 700 square feet compared. It's open to the public. If you're in Philadelphia, you can go take a look at it, and it is, it is breathtaking. Um, so there are a few that are larger, but this one really stands out as one of, the, one of the great Tiffany mosaics. Mosaic, by the way, is different from a stained glass window in that with a window, the light is coming through from behind. With a mosaic, the light is bouncing off of it, reflected light from the front. Thank you. Another question. Yes. I think whoever uh, shellacked this deserves a shellacking themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Judy. Yeah, I, you showed that to me earlier, and um, I agree with you that there is no iridescence in that area. Whether the shellac gets in on a microscopic level into the little fissures that create that iridescence or not really needs to be determined. And um, there is a Tiffany Foundation in New York uh, that is very well versed in this, and it might be worth revisiting if only just to test it again to try and determine whether, whether you can't really bring it back to its original, uh, original look. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for your Great, service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, slightly off topic, but early on in your uh, it, it, earlier on in your reading, you mentioned uh, varieties of spiritual experience. The the, the book. Um, uh, did you say that that was written in New Bedford? Um, it was. Um, I have the name of the uh, the author, and was he possibly a minister here at the Unitarian Church? Um, let me get his name again. They have a copy of it in the office downstairs. Um, it's by Dan Harper. Yes, yeah, so he was a minister here, and it's called Liberal Pilgrims, Varieties of Liberal Religious Experience in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Yes, Rochelle. Rochelle.
Well, uh, there are some challenges with marketing a 200 square foot Tiffany mosaic, you know, especially considering that it's it's um, affixed to a very heavy background there and would have to be removed. But there actually is a, somewhat of a precedent for that. The Maxfield Parish uh, mosaic that I mentioned in Philadelphia, it was uh, when the Curtis Publishing Building was, um, the, the, the building itself was inherited by six or seven um, institutions in Philadelphia. And they were having trouble deciding what to do with it. So they decided to sell the building. And they had an opportunity to sell the mosaic separately from the building. It was a mystery buyer. They weren't telling anybody who it was or where it was going. But the city was outraged at the idea that one of their great cultural artistic treasures was going to be leaving the city. And so there was a lot of back and forth. Um, eventually, the city created some, I don't know whether they were ordinances, but that would essentially block the sale of the, um, of the uh, mosaic. And years later, it surfaced that the buyer of the mosaic was Steve Wynn, and then it was going to be sent off to the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas. <laughs> so that was a near miss. Um, I don't remember whether I ever heard how much it was sold for. You can be sure it was a tremendous amount. Uh, but monetary value doesn't really have that much relevance to many of these great objects because they're irreplaceable, they're unique. Um, priceless would be an appropriate word to, uh, to use for them. Well, thank you very much, Kirk. We really appreciate it. It was terrific All learning right. about our thank treasure. You. And I do encourage anyone who's interested to stop over at the Glass Museum and take a look. We have a nice, uh, nice collection there. I'm Judy, one more question. Have you published that write-up? I have not yet, but I have some plans for that, so it will be, it will be coming out. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, it was uh, exciting, and I appreciate your help in that. We're um, running a little late on time, um, which is fine because I loved that, that uh, talk by Kirk. But we're going to eliminate uh, the candles of healing and, and the, um, what was the other thing? The reading? A reading. And uh, go right to the, uh, the centering music. Um, I also wanted to say that if anyone would like to examine the uh, mosaic close up, after the service, come on up and take a look at it. It's really amazing when you can see the individual glass pieces.
Please stand if you are able and read the responsive reading, which is in your order of service. It's also number 540 in the hymnal if you don't have an order of service. Today, the peace of autumn pervades the world. spreading over the deserted fields to all horizons in its wings of golden green. The many distant villages bask in the sun with eyes closed in idle and languid summer slumber. In every speck of dust, in every part of my own body, in the visible and invisible worlds. Amen. 
And um, I think we'll skip over the hymn because of the same reason, because we're running out of time. Uh, today, is, this is the time in our service when we um, ask you to make your generous contributions to support this church. We are a small congregation, and, and it's essential that we all step up and, and try to keep things going. Thank you. <laughs> The closing words are by Barbara Pearson, Pes Peskin, P-E-S-C-A-N. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, to bow to the mystery. And um, I will extinguish the chalice.